What is up, Earthnoids and Space Noids? I am just a simple new type, and in this episode, we are diving back into the final days of the One Year War as we go through the plot to Assassinate Guerin, Volume 2. Last time, we learned about our protagonist, Leopold Feiseller. He is investigating an assassination attempt on Guerin Zabi that goes way over his head. He was set up and arrested by the chief of the Department of Safety. This episode, Leo will escape jail. He will find out the meaning behind the data of the Valkyrie disc, and we will better understand the divide between Kaecilia and Girin. So let's get into this. December 27th, UC 0079. Girin is giving his Solomon speech. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister Darcia Baharo and Vice Prime Minister Oleg are meeting in what looks like an empty parliament. Behind him is a statue of Zeon Zum Daikum. Inside is a shrine to the fallen, including the Zabi family. Darcia believes that his country lost its future once Garma Zabi died. He was the hopeful future that the Principality of Zeon needed, and we see that Degwin knows this. Once Garma was dead, he lost all hope. I think what Darcia is saying is absolutely reflecting Degwin's inner thoughts. This is shown to us, the viewer, as Degwin is constantly listening to old voice recordings of Garma. Is this manga making me empathize with Degwin? Oleg says, what about Minerva Zabi? Currently, the Zabi family is being torn apart by Kaecilia and Garen, the two remaining Zabis. Darcia is unsure if she will be influenced by Kaecilia or Garen, but both options seem like a bad choice. Of course, we know that the two Zabis will be killed at a bow coup. He also briefly mentions that Kaecilia seems to be on the side of her father bringing peace through surrendering. Oleg wonders why he is telling him all this knowledge as he could go and tell Garen's elite guard. Darcia seems to be over it. He leaves everything in the hands of Oleg as he heads to the moon. As he leaves, Oleg mentions one more name. What about Maharaja Khan? Darcia states that he will never leave the moon. Now who is this? Maharaja Khan is the father of Faman Khan, who will go on to lead Neo Zeon. He led an exodus of Zeon soldiers to Axis during the fall of a Bawa coup. Luckily for the Zabi family, Maharaja remained loyal. Darcia leaves for the moon. Valkyrie has another meaning. The team is concerned that two members have been killed, but they don't know why. Specifically, a man named Hrist is concerned. Regenleaf says that he can't say why as it would give away their identities, and he swore to never do that. Regenleaf asks Hrist to trust him. He says that he trusts Regenleaf simply because Heviator trusts Regenleaf. So for now, the trust is mutual. The conference ends, and the man takes off his VR headset to reveal that it is Lance. We cut back to Giren's Solomon speech being broadcasted to the Earth Sphere. He is letting the world know of the death of Dozel Zabi. Elsie goes to Leopold's desk and wonder if he's okay. Leo is in jail after getting set up by the chief. He keeps replaying the events in his head. He wonders if David Schiller is really Regenleaf. Outside of his cell, a man is watching over him. Another man approaches him and gives him tickets to an opera that only royalty and the rich can attain. He tells the man he was never here and enters the cell. It is Jean-Marie Socrates. He told Leopold that there was something suspicious about the chief. He gives him a cigarette as well as a key sensor. He tells him to use this on the door 15 minutes after he leaves. Also, he pulls out a fake gun and gives it to him. He heads out and wishes him luck. Barry Edmund and Billy Morgan are meeting with one another. They appear to be members of Valkyrie. Barry doesn't want to kill Leo and will wait after December 31st after their assassination attempt happens. They are more concerned that someone sent Leo information about Valkyrie and that there is someone out there that knows information about what happened to David Schiller. Billy says that the only people who know are himself, Barry, Regenleaf, and Schiller. And with the best dramatic timing ever, boom, an explosion goes off and the two are killed. Outside of the building, Jean-Marie Socrates is shocked. This was not part of his plan and wonders if Schiller had anything to do with it. The plot thickens. Leo goes up to the door and asks the guard what is going on. The guard leaves to assess the situation. Leo decides to use the key sensor. How this works is he places it up to the door and it slowly decodes the six digit pin. He decodes five digits, only one is left, when suddenly the power goes out and the key sensor fails. He is stuck. Cecilia is in a meeting and having another briefing regarding the battle tactics of the battalion for the parade. One officer mentions that the handicaps of the pilots wouldn't stand a chance in real battle. Cecilia gets a visit from Lieutenant Colonel Eric Mansfield. He is the captain of the Royal Guard and is rocking an amazing 80s mullet. He tells her that he is off to a bow a coup. He wonders why they don't take the battalion more seriously as they may be injured physically and mentally, but they are hardened soldiers. 
He sees the battalion for who they truly are. Unlike all of the officers currently in the room who dismisses Mansfield, he leaves his right-hand man, Phileas Stream, and some of the elite guards on side three as he takes off. Back in jail, Leo is getting frustrated about the power and throws the sensor key right as the power returns. Talk about bad timing. He hears someone yelling outside when suddenly the door opens. It is the guard, but he didn't open the door. It appears that the sensor key worked once the power came back on. They look at each other awkwardly before Leo tackles him and he tries to bail. Later that night at the Royal Opera House, Major General Lautrec Hamilton is meeting with Brigadier General Henry Slesser. Slesser tells Lautrec that he has reached the point of no return. He's being very coy, but he wants Lautrec to join in his espionage adventures and assassinating Garen. The Major General declines, but isn't going to do anything about it and merely will be a spectator. Again, both are dancing around the bush not being truly upfront with one another for fear of treason, I imagine. Everyone gets up and applauds. It is Degwin Sotozabi in the royal box. It is the first time that he has been seen in public since the death of Garma. Lautrec uses the opera theater as a metaphor. He tells Slesser to look at the Toto family. They were in ruins until one day they decided to adopt a young boy. This solved their air problem as well as brought them fortune and actually helped them gain influence once again. The young boy adopted happens to be Glimmy Toto. This name hasn't been mentioned yet, but he will play a role in Neo Zeon once we get to Mobile Suit Gundam Double Z. He also notes that since Ramba Rao has died, the Rao family no longer exists, and their box at the theater goes to a new family. Furthermore, he mentions that the Sahalin family no longer has a box at the theater either. This, of course, is referencing the relatives of Ina and Guineas, who we meet in 8th MS team. Lots of fun little Easter eggs in this conversation, but ultimately, the Major General is saying that he loves to watch the political drama play out, and he won't get in his way. This is great. We cut back to Leo, who is actually losing against the guard and failing to escape. Jean-Marie Socrates has to come in and judo chop the guard. He tells Leo to get out of here while also calling the chief and telling him that Leo escaped. He has to maintain the illusion that he isn't involved, I suppose. He tells Leo to go visit Henry. If you remember, Henry was the forensic scientist who looked over the package that Leo received by Valkyrie. He goes to visit Henry and he shows Leo that he finished analyzing the Valkyrie disc. Henry puts his hands up and nods at the security camera. Leo finally understands and pulls out the fake gun and makes it seem like he is getting this information by force. He tells Leo that the disc runs on the Xeonic operating system Harmony but he then found a computer language that he never seen before. However, upon further analysis, he found an emulator that runs random software and was able to find a link to an old EFF operating system designed to be used as an operating system for a colony. These scientists were later all drafted into the army. He gives Leo the names of the scientists. It is only five people. One of these people was Mario Antonescu, which was the mysterious scientist that was assassinated recently. They all seem to be stationed at Granada and may have joined MIP. Remember, MIP is a small weapons development company that is responsible for Xeon's mega particle cannons as well as the Bigro. He gives all the data and puts it on a flash drive. Henry tells Leo he now has to pretend to knock him out. Leo proceeds to actually hit him in the head and runs away. Elsie is outside waiting to pick him up. Leo says that he needs to contact someone named Reinhardt. He goes to a store where they sell gunpla. They sell Gunpla mobile suits inside of Universal Century? Who's the one getting all that money? He gives the store clerk a cryptic message about wanting a specific model. This of course is a coded message to contact Reinhardt. His phone suddenly rings and a messenger tells him to meet at the cafe in front of the old Daikum mansion. He goes to the cafe and meets with Reinhardt. The two don't face each other. She gives him an old photo of the members of the research department at the military academy before the war. In the picture is David Schiller, Cecilia Eileen, and Henry Slesser. Slesser was supposedly a Daikum loyalist who was a professor at the military academy. His ties to Daikum led to a desk job manning the good work squad. Cecilia was always a Garen loyalist, and Schiller left the military due to an illness and joined the Department of Public Safety in peace. And then the attempted assassination on Garen happened, and every Daikum loyalist was arrested. Everyone except Slesser. David Schiller's last known whereabouts was him going to arrest Slesser but he left without arresting him and was never seen again. What happened during that conversation? Back at Command HQ, Brigadier General Slesser gets a visit from a man named Kyle Klein. 
Klein wastes no time and ponders to his face why David Schiller never arrested him a year ago. Slicer says that he must be mistaken because his charges were dropped. He then switches the subject to Granada, being in a state of chaos and without a commander. Specifically, there is too much of a divide between the Kaecilia faction and the Girin faction. Klein goes into detail about Girin, murdering those who oppose him and even threatening to nuke Side 6. Of course, this is referring to the Cyclops team and the events that happened in War in the Pocket. He is essentially stating that Kaecilia knows of Valkyrie and their plan to assassinate Garen, and she too wants them to go through with the plan. The problem is that they are concerned what will happen in the aftermath of this situation. He believes that the people of Zeon will declare themselves a republic once again and make peace with EFF. Klein gives Slesser a memory card. It contains a video recording of Shar at Granada after talking to Kaecilia. He is alone and he takes off his mask. Slesser recognizes that Shar is none other than Kassaval Rim Daikum. Kaecilia believes that Kassaval could play a role in rebuilding a new Zeon. In Mobile Suit Gundam, Kaecilia tells Shar that he knows he is Kassaval. I assume she knows because of this video. Even though in the show, she mentions that she kind of knew who she was from the beginning, I am sure this video is what solidified that notion. Klein leaves Slesser, one of Kaecilia's personal Musai class ships, in his presence as a sign of trust. Klein is putting a lot of faith in Slesser right now as he could report this to Command HQ. He leaves and lets him make that decision for himself. At Command HQ, Phileas and the Battalion are planning a test procedure when the Royal Guard and the Battalion start to butt heads. They make fun of the Battalion for missing limbs. Lance goes out and fights one of the units for insulting their pride. Phileas takes off towards the fight. Lance in the Goof Custom and the Royal Guard in the F2 start to fight one another. He throws the F2 with ease. The Commander comes in and stops them from continuing. He says he will file a formal complaint on Lance. After talking to Reinhardt, he heads out and tries to find a place as he is now a wanted man. Reinhardt tells him that since the war has started, one third of Zeon's population is dead. Because of this, there is so much of the colony that isn't populated anymore. So much so that the colony turns on lights in certain areas to give the illusion that people are still living there. She suggests that he use this as an opportunity. At a Bawaku, Kaecilia is looking over the new Jiang mobile suit. She wonders why the Saikomu system is offline, and this is because all of the test pilots couldn't handle it. And more specifically, it is hard at the moment to find any new types because Garen doesn't believe in new types. Kaecilia says she will personally select the pilot. She is sure that she will be able to destroy the Gundam with Shar's new Galgoog and the Elmith. So we know that this occurs right before Amado's encounter with Lala. Meanwhile, Valkyrie hosts their final meeting and begins their plan. And that will do it for this episode. A lot of Volume 2 involves Leo finally knowing the knowledge that us, the reader, kind of assumed. Nonetheless, we get to truly see how divided the nation of Zeon was between Kaecilia and Giren. It actually seems that the majority of Zeon leans towards hating Giren and wanting him dead. In Volume 3, Leo will have to talk to his grandfather, one of the founding members of Zeonic, and Jean-Marie Socrates finally finds David Schiller. But that will do it for now, new types. Remember, no matter how good technology gets, nothing will ever beat a metal lock. Peace.